Let's get started. As always in Suits, we have a program which looks fantastic, and the only worry I have is how we shall uh, keep to the time schedule. Uh, there are so many things, I think, in this program we could debate for hours. But uh, let's start with a very hot topic, and it is the U.S. Preventive Services I Task Force yes. recommendations, which uh, we now have been have for one and a half year almost. And uh, from the beginning, we said this is maybe an American uh, twist and uh, how they look upon it. But I think uh, uh, everyone in the world now are very aware of these recommendations, and I think they will spread. So we will start now with uh, pro and con uh, discussion, or at least a different view on these recommendations. And we have Peter Albertson here first as our first speaker, and Peter, very welcome. And Please. Jonas, thank you. And thank you again uh, for inviting me, Franz. Uh, it's a real pleasure to be here. And it feels like I'm leading off exactly where I finished two years ago, uh, which is on this very topic. I thought it important that uh, we look at the actual document. This is the Annals of Internal Medicine report, which actually documents what's going on. Um, the pointer is this one? Yeah. The key is that the uh, main focus of the report is to look at the issue of reduction of screening is very, very small. They're not saying it does not work, but the harms of screening are substantial. So many people say, yes, the US Preventative Services Task Force concludes recommend against screening, but it's they're recommending against it because they believe the harms outweigh the benefits. And that's a key point I want to focus in on because I think that will drive a lot of our discussion later today. The way they lay this out, they say, what are the benefits and harms of screening 1,000 men age 55 to 69? Why do they pick those ages? Because that is the age range of the ERSBC trial. They state, for those who have no screening, five men in 1,000 will die of this disease. With screening, or despite screening, four to five men out of a thousand will die, therefore only one benefits out of a thousand. And we'll go where they get that number from. They say in contrast, as many as 100 to 120 men will have some potential problem from the biopsy, or more significantly, about 110 men will sustain morbidity uh, from associated with the treatment. And therefore, from the US Preventative Services Task Force, from a public health perspective, they believe these harms outweigh this benefit. That is the crux of what they're trying to tell us. So let's quickly run through this. What does, uh, how, uh, does PSA screening decrease prostate cancer mortality? Fritz Roeder is in the audience. Jonas, I believe, will bring us an update of the RSBC trial, so I'm not going to spend any more time. We're all familiar <coughs> with this graph, but I want to focus in on the punchline of this graph is a relative risk reduction of anywhere from 20 to 30 percent of mortality relative risk reduction. That's not how the US Preventative Services Task Force looks at this problem. They look at it more from this perspective, an absolute risk reduction. They'll say in the screen population, about 9% of the patients were diagnosed with prostate cancer compared to the control population, but the substantial number of cases found were relatively low risk cancers. That's not to say we didn't find higher risk cancers, but the vast majority of additional cases are the low risk cancers. When we look at the mortality rate, this is the one in a thousand difference. Basically, in the control population, four out of a thousand die from the disease. Screen population, three out of a thousand. This is an absolute risk reduction. So depending on whether you look at it in absolute terms or relative terms, it gives you a different perspective. But the US Preventative Services Task Force is absolute. If you go on the ASCO website, this is how they present these con concepts. Uh, excuse me, this is the incidence of this disease from screening, no screening. When we look on the number of men who died from this disease, no screening, screening. Excuse me, the other way around, screening, no screening. There's that one in a thousand, one box difference. What are the harms? Basically, the uh, U.S. Preventive Services Task Force is concerned that three out of four men undergoing a biopsy will not f be found to have any cancer. Urologists look at that as a non-issue, but in fact, it does lead to some problems. If you look at the ASCO website, this is the number of men out of 1,000 that will be hospitalized because of infections associated with screening. 
What are the benefits? That's one of the key items if you look at the past force. They state that there's no optimum uh, treatment plan for prostate cancer and criticize urologists for this. Uh, I think uh, Matthew will be, uh, Michael will be talking a little more as an update of the SBCG4 trial, but again, if we focus in from the U.S. Preventative Set Services Task Force point of view, they're concerned that there's no screening uh, advantage, advantage to sc uh, screening and treatment in men over 65. In the U.S., that's probably over half the men who are being screened currently. Uh, in addition, we have the PIVOT trial from the U.S., Again, showing relatively little difference from between those who are screened and those who are treated. I think we're all familiar with this graph that suggests an advantage to the intermediate and high-grade tumors, but suggests no difference for men with low-grade uh, uh, cancers. They were the bulk of the men identified by screening. So what are the harms of early stage? I think I'll focus on Marty Sanders' paper, which uh, is one of many millions of paper that documents that you can have uh, problems related to radiation therapy and brachytherapy all lead to urinary problems, bowel problems, and uh, sexual problems. So how did this translate into how the AUA, American Urological Association, formulated their new screening guidelines? Uh, Dr. Ballantyne Carter, many of you know him, he served as chair of the committee. He asked me to serve as vice chair. We published these in the journal of Urology. Uh, we focused in the below 40. I don't think there's much discussion on screening men below 40, but the prevalence of prostate cancer is less than a tenth of 1%. In that same group of patients, you'll see 5 to 10% autopsy cancer, so therefore the risk of finding an indolent, uh, uh, um, indolent cancer is quite high. We spent a lot of time on this age range group. Um, as you notice, the old guidelines started at 50. The current guidelines start at 55. Why is that? Because the de uh, evidence of benefits starts at 55 in the ERSPC trial. So therefore, we, we made sure that these ages matched. We also focused on the fact that the potential mortality reduction in this group is still relatively modest. I think a lot of, I don't know if Hans Lilia is in the audience yet, but I think we'll be talking a lot about his paper because we certainly had a lot of discussion on this paper when we were trying to focus on should we include screening, a baseline screening at age 40. Uh, many, many, uh, much time was spent on trying to focus in, but ultimately we determined that the panel explicitly stated that guidelines do not imply that there's no benefit to PSA screening or specifically screening a single uh, a patient at age 40. However, we cannot uh, have any, we have no evidence that this leads to uh, mortality reduction. So again, it comes down to this is a fascinating concept, but right now there's no evidence that having a single PSA at age 40 or age 50 subsequently leads to a mortality reduction. The part of that problem is we haven't proven uh, the absolute benefit of either radiation or surgery. And uh, this is the paper that I think I was ref I'm referring to, uh, where Hans Lilja shows that the men with uh, a uh, higher grade tumor or any cancer diagnosed, if you have a PSA that's elevated, the higher it goes at baseline, the higher the probability of having cancer. The problem is it's still relatively modest numbers and we can't tell which ones precisely will, will, will develop those cancers. Uh, where the American Urological Association said there is benefit, it's age 55 to 69, but again, we, we, we uh, focused in on the fact that a man must weigh the potential mortality reduction during the next decade of one man in a thousand screened against the potential known harms associated with treatment. I think Franz Recker just articulated that in his opening slides. Uh, we recommended shared decision-making. Uh, we discourage mass screening. By that, I mean having a parking lot where you set up a tent and have everybody come in who wants to get a PSA test. Um, the benefits are only likely to accrue to patients with a 10 to 15-year life expectancy. It's that latter statement that's going to lead to the 70 and up recommendation. The other thing that was new about the American Urological Association, we began focusing on the screening interval. Uh, Jonas Hugesson's trial in Sweden focuses on screening every two years. Uh, the uh, rest of the RSPC was focused on four years. Uh, what is commonly done in the U.S. is annual screening. Uh, we believe that annual screening does lead to overdiagnosis and much more likely to uh, find indolent disease, so this comment was introduced uh, with the idea of, of trying to avoid overdiagnosis. And age 70 and above, we just have no evidence uh, from any trials. That's not to say that a small subgroup of very healthy men may benefit. This is written in the AUA guidelines. But when you look at men age 70, once you hit the 10 to 15 year rule, the likelihood of a substantial benefit from a public health perspective uh, falls away. 
So in summary, what is the impact to date? Well, like any change, it changes slowly. I think many internists are still performing PSA testing. Uh, many patients are still demanding PSA testing. Internists have become a bit more cautious in who they're referring for biopsy, and I think urologists have become a bit more cautious about performing prostate biopsies. However, we will not see an impact in incidence rates in the U.S. for at least three more years because the SEER system is lagged by about three years. But in other words, the data they're reporting in 2014 reflects what was going on in 2010 and 2011. And with that, I'll turn this over to Sigurd to uh, have the other side of the debate. Thank you.